Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I guess uh, that's my cue to start. As you see, we have a really heavyweight uh, panel here today. Uh, let me open by saying, ladies and gentlemen, the bad news is you will have to throw out your phones in another few months. But at least uh, this time, it will be a real upgrade. So that's what this uh, panel is about ushering in a new mobile era, basically the 5G era. And as you can see, we have some of the most important stakeholders of the industry of this technology on the stage. So without further ado, let me just uh, briefly introduce everybody. Uh, and then they will have time to uh, make a more detailed introduction. First, uh, uh, lady first. Um, Sihan Bo Chen is the head of Greater China for GSMA Hong Kong SAR China. She's from uh, Hong Kong, China. And Mr. Ken Hu on my left is the deputy chairman and rotating chairman of Huawei Technologies. Um, no further introduction needed probably. Uh, Mr. Jean-Marc Frangos is the chief innovation officer of BT from the United Kingdom. And Mr. Michael Beck, is the head of business strategy from Ericsson, of course, from uh, Sweden. Um, we will open by giving every panelist three minutes to briefly introduce themselves, their businesses, their organizations, and then lay out a couple of main talking points. And then we will start a second and third round questions, during which all of our panelists will be welcome to in in interrupt each other and ask questions of each other as I understand, we do have a couple of uh, minor debates already in this panel. So please, um, lady first, uh, uh, Ms. Chen. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. My name is Han Bo Chen, and I'm representing GSMA today to be here. I'm very glad. And um, before I came, I asked a few questions to our host and um, what is GSMA and what do we do? And some of you said to me, no, we don't have much idea about it. So I think it's a good thing. Everybody knows about 5G and not everybody knows about GSMA, which is fine. And GSMA represents the global mobile operator's interests. We unit uniting about 750 operators in the globe and also we um, work with the wider ecosystem. We have about 350 uh, companies from the mobile ecosystem to be our associate members and I'm, I'm glad to see everybody sitting apart from Mr. Wang and everybody here representing the company our members. Um, what we actually do is to work with the global ecosystem to connect everybody and everyone to a better future. Namely, we bring through 2G, 3G, 4G, and I, we at the doorstep of developing into um, 5G and entering a new world. There are a lot of issues and challenges and opportunities ahead of us. So we're very pleased to be able to work with a bunch of uh, very talented people in the world um, to sort of figure out what 5G and other linked um, technologies like artificial intelligence to be able to um, give us a clear roadmap to go and see what, what's going on in the future with 5G. So that is why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chen. And then we'll just go by seating order. So uh, Mr. Ken Hu, please. Uh, thank you, Fan. This is a great pleasure for me to be here to, to talk about 5G. I've been working uh, in the digital technology industry uh, for almost 30 years. And uh, I've seen a tremendous change um, for example, when we started the first summer Davos um, in Dalian in the year 2007, we didn't have any 4G network, any social media applications like WhatsApp, like WeChat. However, today, what we are talking here, 
people in the different places in the world can easily get access to the you know, video streaming in their mobile device. So this is a big change. And, and thanks to the facet development of the, of the wireless, uh, wireless technology. And I'm very happy to talk about the next big thing, which is 5G. So about the uh, industry progress of, of, of 5G, um, now industry started working on 5G 10 years ago, and we have made tremendous progress. And the first uh, set of standard of 5G was finalized in June of this, uh, this year, which is a great step forward. And our entire industry, from device to the um, infrastructure equipment, has been ready for the you know, 5G deployment. For example, at Huawei, we are a technology provider. We've been working with our you know, customers around the world uh, for you know, more than 50 pre-commercial 5G network, including uh, BT. We're actually working uh, uh, with BT in London. So the whole progress of the 5G in the industry is very positive. And then I would like to talk about what, what we can do with 5G. Because when people talk about 5G, we always talk about automatic cars, the smart um, manufacturing, uh, connected drones. Yeah, agree that those are the you know, uh, applications for the next couple of years, and particularly uh, with some you know, future uh, re release of the 5G standard. But today, I would like to talk more about what we can do with 5G in the short term what we can benefit from 5G immediately. Actually, 5G is the technology which can provide us much faster speed, much lower latency, and much, much more connectivity than our existing 4G technology. So that, that will help us to build a much better user experience on our existing mobile broadband service, and then that will help us to generate many new you know, um, services like um, cloud-based virtual reality application and high definition 4K and, or, or, or 8K on the go. And those new services will also help us to generate many new business op opportunities, not just for operator, but also for other uh, vertical sectors like tourism, education, healthcare, retail, and uh, sport. So I'm really excited about the potential of the 5G that 5G can provide us. And I'm really about, uh, excited about the future of 5G. So I look forward to you know, talking more about that in today's panel discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Hu. Uh, Mr. Frangos, please. Thank you. Yes, so um, I think we're going to be repeating ourselves a lot on this panel because I think we're all very much on the page of this new generation of technology, which is 5G. Um, I'm uh, part of BT. BT has the BT brand and the EE, Everything Everywhere brand in the UK. So we are already, a, uh, I would say, a leader and we're used to providing very high performance and good quality service to our customers. That's what our brand stands for uh, in the UK, certainly on the 4G uh, technology, which is prevalent today. So we're really looking forward to enhancing uh, that experience even more with 5G. And certainly we'll discuss certainly a little bit more what that means. Um, my role in the company, I'm actually not based in London. I'm based in Silicon Valley, and I'm uh, in charge of detecting uh, innovations for the company and driving them through for the benefit of our customers. Um, and in fact, what I was doing before I arrived here in China, I was stopping by in Japan and Korea and uh, consulted with our peers, other operators, about this very question of uh, you know, when and what are they going to be doing with 5G and what are going to be the benefits for their customers. Um, I think the, the, the main thing I'd like to say is that we, we expect the benefits to be significant for our customers. Three classes of benefits, and uh, uh, we already talked a little bit about it, but speed, which is kind of the headline number that everybody remembers, is perhaps not the most important one. Uh, clearly, this latency point uh, that was made earlier is about the response time of the network. And I think we'll come back to that because that is very important. The third bit is actually the reliability 
of that network for business applications. Um, and that will be, I think, transformational and significant. So we've been committed to um, uh, launching 5G in the UK. Um, we're looking to be leaders in 5G in the UK for sure. Since 2016, we've already been testing uh, various elements and various aspects of the technology and we're now getting uh, into much more pre-commercial trials in London, in 10 areas in London. Um, our labs have been contributing to the um, new radio standards. We've been working with 3GPP and the GSMA defining the standard. And we're working, of course, with Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, and uh, the rest of the uh, infrastructure vendors and equipment vendors to bring this to the market in the best possible time. We've announced that we will be launching um, 5G in the UK uh, in 2019. So that's very good news, I think, for, uh, for our customers, for the UK in general, for the industry, to bring this technology forward as much as we can. Um, one point I will make briefly uh, is that we see 5G as an evolution, and even though you jokingly said that people will have to throw away their phones, uh, we would like to think of a future where 5G actually seamlessly integrates with 4G. 4G will continue to exist for a period of time, but also with other wireless technologies like Wi-Fi and also with fixed broadband. So wherever you are in the home, in the office or outside, we are building our customer experience so that customers don't have to think of which is the most appropriate network, whether it is 5G or 4G or Wi-Fi or fixed broadband. So we're hoping to provide the best connected experience to our customers wherever they are. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Mr. Beck? Yes, very happy to be here. Um, I think it's a very interesting timing also in relation to almost commercially launching 5G now. And for me, being in the industry a very long time as well. Uh, since the launch of 2G, we launched 2G in Europe, in Germany in 1991, and then I've been leading the 3G efforts for our company, but also very much with 4G and now 5G. And it's, it's very interesting to see this evolution. So first we managed to connect a much broader range of people with, with GSM than we had with a very scattered local 1G systems leading up to 4G that is very close to a global system that can fulfill a lot of use cases, but not, not everything. And then finally bringing out 5G that is really a system that we designed from the beginning in the industry to really cater for a much broader variety of needs than just the mobile broadband, even if mobile broadband will be a major base of, of revenues and uh, traffic for a long time. The, the mobile ecosystem has never been stronger, I would say, but the major challenge for us right now will be to bring other ecosystems along, driven by the industries, the core industry, the manufacturing industry, a lot of industries that has been bringing out their own very strong ecosystems over a long time. So what we did when we started to work with uh, more real systems around five years, let's say five years ago, was that we started to work and engage with a lot of industrial partners, university partners and so on to see, to get their requirements in on the technology very early because we saw that what they needed from technology, talking about latency and delay times and you mentioned, is, is going to be very different than the smartphone users that we are used to. So I think we've seen that it will take longer time for some of these industries to change, but on the other hand, I think the impact of that will actually be bigger than maybe the change for the smartphone industry. And uh, when we have looked at numbers and so on, we've seen that there is maybe a 900, if we take a 2026 perspective, there is a 900 billion US dollar kind of market for the mobile broadband. Then we have a side market of that that would be fixed wireless, kind of replacing fibers and so on. There we have more certain numbers. When it comes to creating the network platform that will really enable for the digitalization of industries and so on. The numbers are, of course, more varying. Uh, if the operators can mainly support connectivity, maybe it's down to 20% of that number. If we can just take a higher step and really be part of the applications and the digitalization of all these industries, then it's, of course, bigger numbers. But it's, to me, I'm very happy to be here, a very interesting point of time. I think this is very close to what the forum is driving as the fourth industrial revolution really happening much more than we've seen before. 
So very happy to be here. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Beck. Um, so into our first round of questions. Um, please, everybody, feel free to uh, interrupt and ask each other questions. I think uh, that's what we are here for. Um, um, what's a lively panel without a little debate? Um, actually, backstage there, uh, Mr. Hu asked me a question. Um, what do you think 5G is? The question really struck me because even though um, the service is going to roll out uh, in many markets in the next uh, five to six months, uh, 5G phones, you will probably see 5G phones earlier in the next few months. Some Chinese companies are going to uh, roll out their phones, uh, hopefully also including Huawei. But what exactly is 5G? It's supposed to be defined by the use cases. We all know 5G is going to bring a lot of benefits for the average consumer, but also has huge impacts for industries uh, and sectors such as uh, Internet of Things. I sensed a little bit of debate there already backstage because Huawei and BT, for example, seem to have slightly different visions for exactly um, what they're going to do with 5G, uh, what their priority is. Is it a consumer? Is it a, a business? Uh, uh, driverless cars, um, AR, VR. So why don't we start uh, with that? What's your vision of 5G and what is for your business, what's the priority of your early rollout plans? Uh, Mr. Hu? Uh, yeah, that, that's a very important question because before we talk about the application of 5G, the question is, you know, what 5G is. Um, to simply, uh, simply speaking, the 5G means faster speed, much faster speed, much lower latency, and much more connectivity than any of the existing um, mobile technology. Let me give you some figures. 5G will be 100 times faster than the 4G network. And the 5G will be 50 times responsive, more responsive than 4G. And the 5G can provide much more connectivities. See, like this meeting room, we're going to have, yeah, we have around two to 300 audience here. And with the 5G technology, we're going to provide thousands of connectivities in this meeting room. That, that means we're going to get everything connected. And this is from the technology perspective. And I think the key concern from the consumer is that what we can do with 5G. Um, for the long term, I agree that you know, autonomous car, uh, smart manufacturing, all these things are the you know, futuristic application. That, that's very important. However, we should focus more on the short term, what we can do with 5G immediately. Fung just mentioned that maybe in the next couple of months, we're going to throw out all of our you know, smartphones. Yeah, I don't think that's the, that's the case. However, uh, we, we will have an upgrade on our de device. So as a consumer, we will firstly feel that, you know, what's, what's going to be the change on, on, on our device? So when we talk about 5G, we should not miss the device, not, not miss the device. What, what I can share with you is that uh, the roadmap for our industry on the device side on 5G is to launch the smartphone uh, in next year. And at Huawei, we're going to launch our first smartphone uh, in the mid of 2019. And yeah, it will take the advantage of the 5G network with uh, faster speed, lower latency. So let me share with you uh, something in detail. For example, in our first smartphone, we're going to introduce the foldable screen. This is for the first time to introduce the foldable screen on the smartphone. So, let, so let's imagine, with a much faster speed, 100 times faster than today, you're going to enjoy an amazing experience with a big screen on your smartphone with you know, high definition video. And lower latency will help you to get much better uh, user experience with the artificial intelligence functionality because it will help the smartphone, which is working with some on-device artificial intelligence functionality, work better uh, with the you know, cloud-based artificial intelligence. And that will allow us 
to generate many new you know, uh, AI applications. And also, um, in terms of the uh, advantage of you know, massive connectivity, that means at the era of, of 5G, we're going we're gonna to be able to get everything connected. That will give us a huge opportunity to develop a different you know, format of device, the sensor to connect to the, the shoes, the glass, so that, that that's, a, that's, a, that's an unlimited picture for us you know, to, to develop the different devices and to generate um, you know, the, the different kind of new services. So my point is that we're going to you know, take advantage of the 5G, not just for the long term, but also for the short term. So the question is that how we're going to speed up the deployment of the 5G and how we can encourage the consumer and the industry, uh, industrial company to embrace the new technology and to take advantage of the technology. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hu. So my takeaway is uh, from Huawei's point of view, the most immediate beneficiaries of the 5G technology will be consumers. And that's where your early focus will be on. Um, OK, that's, I think, where um, Mr. Frangos may have a slightly different priority. So I, I, won't, I certainly won't say that consumers will not benefit from 5G. Certainly our EE brand, we will be bringing the benefit of 5G to our consumers first in 2019. There's no question about it. I think where we do, where we discussed a little bit the um, difference of opinions, perhaps I'm slightly more impatient with regards to the business use cases. And I think Mr. Hughes said that they will come in a second phase. Yes, of course, there will be a second phase. I think the question for the industry is how do we stimulate this phase to arrive sooner rather than later? Because there is significant value enhancements in the use of 5G for smart manufacturing, for automotive industry, and a number of other use cases. So uh, in terms of um, what will come first, I think clearly the consumer applications will come first. But one point I'd like to make about 5G is we always think of it as a, you know, the equipment manufacturers in this, in this, uh, on this panel, operators will be bringing it to the market and create the network. But there's a third category of people, which are the application developers, of course. Mm -hmm. And this is where stimulating those uh, these creative ideas for the application developers is something that's really important for 5G. I mean, today, already, we, we know and we've seen uh, a lot of creativity around 4G, around mobile in general, with social application, commerce applications, all sorts of applications. I think with 5G, there will be even more intensity in the creation of video type applications. Not just one way video, but two way video, people creating videos, user generating video content perhaps. There will be a lot more intensity in the VR and augmented reality domains. And these have already started in fact, both Apple and Android, uh, Google, uh, st started stimulating this market already at the end of last year with the uh, announcements of Arcor and Arkit, which are tool sets that application developers can use to create these new AR and VR applications. Today, when you look at these AR, VR experiences on 4G, it is still not perfect. And I think 5G will bring very, very lifelike experiences. And then there's another category of applications that will be stimulated by 5G. And they have to do with AI. And really, AI today, again, is, is a bit of a specialist affair. You really need to have data scientists to take advantage of AI. It's not open for everyone to use AI, to use all the power of AI. And I think 5G will stimulate opening up AI in the form of um, AI um, tool sets and applications sitting on the cloud available to any application developer. Uh, that will make a significant difference because it will be about linking the real world with the virtual world. So I think that I, I predict 5G will have a significant impact there. We can talk more about that. Great, thanks very much. That's a really uh, very inspiring picture for the future. Um, for Ms. Chen, as we agreed, why don't you help me be the judge or, or a reviewer of this round and uh, let uh, uh, the gentleman speak first and then of you course. help me yeah. uh, uh, give a review of yeah. what you think the situation looks like. Uh, Mr. Beck first, please. I think it's, um, 
there is not going to be a killer application for 5G. I think that's very clear. There will be multiple cases. It, it's a platform, as I said, for both consumers and new users that we haven't seen before. I think there is, um, as, as with all other technologies, it's very often applications that we have never thought of when we design the technology that will be the big thing later. And I think one, to me, very interesting thing working very much with industrial cases and so on was when we, we had, uh, I think it was Verizon hosting an innovation forum in the US where there was a CEO from one of the gaming companies talking about the impact of 5G for gaming. And it's really revolutionary if you can get the kind of speeds that we're talking about, plus that you can guarantee a latency below, let's say, 10 milliseconds. It changes the way you design games because you no longer have to download games on your phone and you can give all players the same uh, environment. While today, a lot of game manufacturers have to kind of fix the game so it works even for people with bad conditions and so on. So they will completely change the, the game for them. And, and of course, AR and VR and the kind of things we talked about. Uh, but also, when I, when I look at the global market, I think it will happen differently in different places. Right now, we see things happening first maybe in the US, and then we see a lot of actions in uh, Korea, Japan, China, as we talk about here. I think you see a little bit different push in Europe. There is a lot of the industrial push first. If you go to Germany, for example, with what they are trying to do with uh, Industrie 4.0, which is very much a cluster where we are engaging, not because we lo know a lot about um, industrial robots and so on, but we know a lot about things that is very close to their pain point. I think they have been connecting machines with uh, quite expensive, purpose-built, very often cabled technologies and so on. That we can make a huge impact, even if we will never be experts in, in the part that they are into and so on. So I think it will actually happen in slightly different ways, also in different markets, based on the same platform, most likely with mobile broadband paying for a fairly big part of the investment, I would still say. Great. So, Ms. Chen, basically our gentlemen speakers have laid out the leading voices and views of the industry on uh, uh, what 5G is and what the uh, main use cases are. So, what do you think and what's the industry consensus right now? I think the audience probably got it already from their um, comments on what is 5G and what 5G can bring to us. It is very clear that it is coming, and GSMA intelligence already forecast we have 1.3 trillion, uh, sorry, 1.3 billion mobile uh, 5G connections by 2025, and in this region where the mo world largest uh, mobile 5G connections will will be, uh, APAC region will be 675 million and China alone will be around 400 million 5G connections by 2025. It's happening, but when we talk about 5G, we still need to carefully think um, from different stakeholders what 5G means to everybody. Okay, we need to make sure the technology is ready, the market is ready, and the operators are ready. What does that mean? It means that when we say 5G will change the society, it is not just operators' business to roll out a 5G net network despite the heavy investment in it. It is not just a network previously, previous generations, you can roll out and people can play on it. And 5G has a different character in it, which enable the network to be sliced and like tailor-made to different industries' needs. So, which means it is not just operator's business, it is the policymaker can have the supportive policy framework ready. It is the vertical industries working closely with operators to understand and bring out the potential of what we, our guest uh, panelist was saying about the low latency, high speed and super fast broadband. 
So um, I would represent our uh, industry to call upon people, calm down a little bit. It is, yes, it is coming. It's definitely coming. We can't stop it. But in the meantime, um, let's all work together to think carefully and form more partnerships between operators, between vendors, between our um, vertical partners. It is happening, but it, we still need to encourage more. And which means after we invest heavily in this 5G brilliant network, and I, I read a report, um, a figure shows that in 5G era, um, every customer will consume at least 100 um, gigabit, megabits um, um, data per month. And at the moment, the high span is about 40. So um, if you stream uh, on AR or VR or video stream, on 8K, it will cons for an hour, it will, it will consume about 175. So it, it's, there are, 5G network will be able to provide all this, but I agree with you, there is not just one killer, and it is not just consumers. It's about society and it's about industrial IOT is about vertical different industries will be able to work together and bring the potential of 5G to the reality. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is um, a more sobering aspect of uh, the 5G technology and all the business uh, prospects is the cost. So who's going to pay for it? Uh, from what I gather, uh, the costs for uh, 5G-related re infrastructure is going to be significantly higher than 4G, and uh, uh, there still isn't a industry-wide consensus as for how we're going to afford that costs, and also, of course, the costs of, uh, for operators maintaining the network down the road. Um, and Ms. Chen, if you could uh, start with a question, uh, what are the main um, models these days for uh, um, shouldering the 5G related costs because consumers are most unlikely to pay for, to pay more for 5G than for 4G or for 3G uh, um, for that uh, uh, matter because we don't, we sim simply don't believe for paying more these days for better services. Yeah. Then uh, who's going to come up with the additional cost? Uh, it seems, still seems to be a question that's troubling the industry right now. Yes, you're so right about it. It's uh, a lot of uh, operators paying at the moment. Yes, 5G, we should roll out. Um, if you're late, you probably miss a lot of opportunities. But in the meantime, who's going to pay for it? Where is the business model? Um, I think the the first thing come to um, many people's mind will be the supportive um, policy frame in terms of spectrum. Set the reasonable reserve price um, and some of the government already, I think including China, already roll out some policies to reduce the um, burden on the spending on the 5G spectrum. And also, um, I think what I mentioned previously is you can't just solely rely on the connectivity and consumers to pay for it. It's, it's not going to happen. So, which we all mentioned about innovation, we need to think about how to make the most of the partnership with other industry and verticals and help to other industry to understand that 5G network plus AI will change their industry. Mm. It's at the moment probably you see um, evolution, but then will soon be um, transformational. It will transform a lot of industries and eventually from our prediction, it's going to be revolutionary especially with AI 
and cloud-based services. Um, so every industry got to really look into these opportunities, how your industry is going to work with 5G and AI to really um, make your business a success. Great, thank you. So, Mr. Hu, what's your take on that issue? Uh, yes, for any uh, new technology, the cost should be a very uh, um, important consideration, including the 5G. Um, actually, in our industry, um, when we started working on 5G 10 years ago, we took the cost as a serious consideration from the end-to-end -end perspective. For, for our industry, when you, when you talk about the cost of 5G, we always talk about um, the cost of the, of, the, of the data, data traffic. Um, and then you can look at the structure of the cost uh, of the 5G. There are some key uh, uh, aspect. First is the, is the cost of the equipment, of the infrastructure equipment. That's uh, normally for the carriers is, is, the, is the capex. Actually, uh, with 5G, we um, provided lots of in, uh, innovation technology which helped the carriers to greatly enhance the efficiency of the spectrum. Uh, and that will help the you know, uh, operators to lower the cost of the, uh, of the data traffic. And another cost is the uh, operation cost. To be honest, the, the 5G technology is much, much more complicated than any existing mobile technology. So in the tech, from the technology perspective, we introduced some emerging uh, technology like the artificial intelligence to help to, uh, to, help to uh, you know, simplify the you know, um, operation like the configuration of the network, and that will help the operators to greatly reduce the OPEX, which is nowadays, which is three to four times of the, uh, of the OPEX. And another part of the end-to-end of the -end cost is actually the cost of spectrum resource and the fiber optic. And here is the area where the you know, regulator and the government can help a lot. So we hope that the government can help to supply more sufficient you know, spectrum resource to the market in a more reasonable mechanism with the lower cost. That will greatly help the industry to lower the end-to-end -end, you know, cost of the, uh, of the 5G service. And also, we will welcome more supportive policies to help you know, carriers to, to deploy more fiber optic on the ground with much lower cost. Because when we talk about the 5G, 5G is not just about the air interface. It's not just a wireless technology. 5G is about the end-to-end -end architecture. And yeah, 5G will carry on huge amount of data. So while the carriers can deploy more fiber optical networks with a lower cost, then it will help to you know, better accommodate the fast growing data traffic and help to reduce the overall cost of the 5G. Great, thank you. Mr. Frangos, you also earlier mentioned uh, the prospect of AI helping uh, reduce costs or uh, raising efficiency. Do you think that is a practical solution in the near future? Yeah, that, that's, that's a slightly different side of AI, right? We were talking earlier about enabling applications via AI tool sets for developers and what we just talked about here is a slightly different way of right, using right. AI to reduce the cost of our operations. Um, so yeah, we, we, we are realistic about the fact that for every generational technology investment for telecommunications operators, there is always a challenge in finding the equilibrium, right? And there's, there's always a, uh, a, a period of time where you're not exactly sure um, how that equilibrium will be reached. But we, we are certainly uh, uh, confident it will uh, uh, be possible and we're, we're going in this direction exactly. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the, 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 the way, I mean, just to add on to the point that was just made, <clears throat> 5G is the first generation of technology that is being deployed with AI supporting it. Uh, this was not the case with 4G. 
Uh, 4G was the technology that had IP at the center of it, which helped rationalize some of the backhaul and some of the traffic on the network. But 5G is a very different uh, scenario. And um, uh, I think most of the operators are in the process of transforming the way they work and transforming it from, um, you've probably heard about this software-defined networking and network function virtualization. What that means is that we are using a lot more of the modern IT models to run the functions of our network. And we're certainly uh, hoping that we'll get a lot of support, as already mentioned, uh, from our uh, equipment vendors to make the running of that network a lot more like an automated running of a data center, um, which has a low cost of operation typically. Um, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned there and a lot of expectations that the operations of a 5G network, even though it is inherently more sophisticated, uh, will allow us to, um, to run it more efficiently and sm more smoothly. The point about spectral efficiency was already made. So this is our hope as well that on a cost per information transported, uh, we will have a better equation with 5G. So there's, there's a lot of hope that there are mitigating factors uh, with the support of the, uh, the, the industry and the ecosystem around this. Thank you. Mr. Beck? So uh, to me, the cost comes from many different points. And what will happen is that we will have around eight times more traffic in 2023 that we have to cater for. And if you look at everything you can do with 5G, which is adding all the spectrum we can and so on, then of course the maximum efficiency of a radio site can be maybe up to 10 times higher than an average site today. So there is the cost efficiency if you really look at the extreme traffic cases. But I think it also comes back to spectrum as we talked about. That is the lifeblood of our industry. Spectrum is what everything is built from and there governments and regulators have a very strong role to make that a good system, a predictable system. And Again, we, we know what happened in, in Europe when we had these licenses for 3D in year 2000 that pulled the whole profit from the industry for a couple of years. That was very challenging for the whole industry for some time. I think a lot of technology innovation will also help uh, cost. I think uh, AI is one. We are already using automation, machine learning, and so on and on. We have what we call managed services, that is running networks for operators for around maybe one billion customers. Then we start to use a lot of these technologies already, so it's not uh, only future, it's actually what you can do today. Um, then I think for the whole digitalization of the systems, there, there is a lot more that can be done in what we call the operation and support systems to automate operations. We will also have cases where not only the operators, but also in some cases utilities or building owners or public safety where you have someone operating the network that is less skilled than BT, for example, that needs a fully automated network even more. So I think there is cases where we need to pull that lever even further. And then, of course, upgradability. So for the first time, we designed 5G to be a system that is really built on the coverage that we have from 4G, both in terms of uh, access to lower spectrum, but also that we can upgrade with software all equipment, all radio equipment that we have delivered since 2015. So there is a number of steps we need to take that together will build the cost picture. And maybe last but not least, it, it's not only about the box price, it's really some of the major cost for the operator is spectrum, it is access to sites. So if we can bring out technology that really utilizes spectrum more efficiently, or decreases the number of sites you need to cover a certain area, that cost saving is very much higher than the equipment price decrease. So we do a lot of work there as well. I think that's important. Great, thank you. Um, events in the last year, including, for example, uh, um, trade frictions between China and the US, and of course, this morning, we have this uh, latest 200 billion uh, dollars, uh, a tariff on another $200 billion worth of uh, uh, Chinese goods to the U.S. And GDPR, for example, and also uh, um, security concerns that's uh, arisen in some Western countries about uh, uh, Huawei's technology. Uh, these all seem to complicate matters for the rollout of uh, 5G services. Um, as major industry players, um, 
what's your um, estimate on the um, impacts of these events, and uh, what's your strategy on um, uh, dealing with them? Uh, Mr. Hu, please. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, Ms. Chen just uh, talked about, you know, uh, in order to uh, uh, widely, you know, deploy 5G, we need to get ready on technology, we need to get ready on the market, so we need to get ready on the, um, Operators. you know, the operator. <laughs> and actually, I'd like to add one point, which is uh, we need to get ready on the awareness of the, you know, security of 5G. Is uh, yeah, we've we've been working with our operators around the world, uh, with our customers around the world, and we observed that you know one of the challenges at this stage is the lack of a clear understanding of the security of 5G. Is uh, from the from the technology perspective, actually, 5G is more secure than 4G. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me give you more detail because. Um, at the beginning of the standard development, yeah, the industry has been uh, working very hard on developing a you know, secure architecture for the 5G. So now from the architecture perspective, 5G inherits and built on the same architecture, secure architecture on the 4G, and is even more secure than that. For example, uh, the 5G will accommodate huge amount of data. So the security working group in the 3GPP has been, you know, um, collaboratively, uh, collaboratively, you know, working with, you know, thousands of uh, experts from, you know, dozens of companies on designing a layer architecture for the, you know, protection of the data transmission. Uh, let me give you an example. In the 4G, we use the encryption of 100. Uh, uh, 128 bits, and in 5G, uh, our industry doubled encryption, uh, in, in encryption from 128 to 256. Uh, uh, so this is a huge improvement on the protection of the data transmission. So this is just one example of, of the consideration on the security of 5G. So no matter from the technology or the standard perspective, actually, 5G is more secure than, the, than, than 4G. However, uh, it's disappointing that in some of the earlier stage of the uh, technology discussion, um, there is a lack of professional understanding and discussion on the technology itself. So we will encourage that at any time when we talk about you know, 5G, we should, be, we should be ready on the awareness of the 5G security, and we should firstly leave the discussion to you know, the people who really understand the technology and to, to, to conduct the discussion in a more professional way. Right. Uh, Mr. Frangles, apart from the security concerns, also um, um, reverberations on the uh, um, supply chain, for example. Uh, what are all these events going to, uh, how are they going to affect the 5G technology yeah. rollout? I, I would say the, um, uh, you know, running a national infrastructure network in any country is something that is normally taken very seriously. Um, and, and so we, we have a lot of controls and robust security testing in place. When it comes to supply chain, we pay a lot of attention to not just the first level, but the second layer of supply chain and how do we make sure that um, we can meet, mitigate the risks, of course, for the supply. Um, but in general, I mean, GDPR is the same. These are not really new risks, if we're really honest. I mean, these are things that have been around for a long time. We've been dealing with our uh, uh, suppliers, Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, for a long time. And um, also, we have a very good uh, mechanism with the uh, national, UK National Cyber Security Council to work jointly with them to um, uh, agree what the process is and make sure that we have no national security risk. So all of that is, I would say, uh, nearly business as usual, but business as usual that is taken very, very seriously. So Ms. Chen, uh, from a industry uh, group's point of view, how serious are these uh, uh, events and their impacts, do you think? Yeah. It 
GSMA is a international organization. We don't get into politics. Uh, as th at the beginning I said, we would like to uh, promote the healthy and sustainable development for our mobile industry. So from that point of view, um, I have to say there are some politics um, affected our industry's development um, previously, like the ZTE, okay. So what GSMA would like to do is um, still do our job right. So on behalf of uh, our in, uh, operators community, if there are events affect the industry's um, healthy development or sustainable development, GSMA would um, take some points and um, trying to talk to various st stakeholders and trying to solve the situation. But it is really hard for a international organization to get into any politics. Um, so it is a very hard question to me. So it's mostly politics in your view? I think it started from politics, but um, like I said, the consequences may impact the health development of our industry. Um, for example, the ZTE case. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Beck? Uh, to me, it's also a reflection that telecom is no longer only telecom, but it's, it's really part of the world. So when globalization goes into more multi-local, or especially the big markets applying different policies, we have to be very, very close to these governments and regulators as, as we have been for a long time. And it's, Security is really, really important for our systems and will be even more when you start to use for many of the other industries. Public safety, for example, wouldn't even touch our equipment if we couldn't guarantee security. And we are already today deploying LTE systems for public safety in, in some of the big markets. So I think some of these cases completely rely on that we get people to trust what we do. Uh, so to me, it's super important. On top of that, of course, privacy and all these uh, data regulations that is coming where we have to be able to show and guarantee where we store data and so on. So we have a lot of technologies coming back to, to the cloud and distributed workloads and so on where we have the possibility to place functionality wherever we want in the network and we have to utilize that very much in conjunction with the regulations on we have a lot of work now with IoT, for example, in some big markets, the data has to be handled in certain ways. So there is a lot of those requirements that we haven't had in the same way before. But I think it's really us being part of the new world that is developing. I think we have technology-wise the tools to do that in a very good way, but we have to be very close to the, to the markets, the regulators, the, the governments. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, about seven minutes left. Um, we do have plans for a few questions from the audience. So uh, as we agreed earlier with the panelists, the way this works well, I will uh, take uh, two or three questions from the audience uh, one by one. And then we run all of them through the panel for one round. Anybody can uh, uh, feel free to answer to any of these questions they would like. Um, so please. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, panel, for an excellent uh, conversation. Uh, my name is Omar Abosh. I'm Accenture's chief executive of our comms media and technology business. Um, I have no doubt that uh, our network operators and network of equipment OEMs will for sure figure out how to overcome the CapEx, OpEx, R&D, and Spectrum challenges and deploy 5G. The, the question for me is how will we avoid watching the margin migrate up the stack towards companies that perhaps have deeper insight into customers or deeper relationships with end customers. All right. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll remember that and uh, take another question from the audience, please. Uh, this gentleman, please. I just had one question, uh, generally. Uh, there was a World Health Organization's report which talked about uh, serious health issues, including cancer, 
because of high radio frequency uh, and 5G probably can you know make it five times more than what it is today. Uh, I don't know whether there's a point of view the audience has got or is any kind of uh, you know uh, regulatory or otherwise from a, from a company's point of view. Any any work is being done to look at what exactly is the impact, including you know high radiation, cancer, and so on and so forth. All right, thank you very much. So I think we only have time for these cool questions. Uh, please do free, uh, feel free to ask, ask questions of our panelists after this. We we'll, may have a little bit of time. Uh, but why don't we take the, the health impact question first? Mr. Hu, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, can, uh, I can generally you know, talk about how we're gonna, you know, leverage the capability of 5G uh, in the midterm and the long term on different vertical industry applications, and I think that's actually uh, one of the, you know, uh, advantages of 5G, because uh, when we talk about 4G or you know 3G, we are actually, you know, benefiting from uh, the the capability that help us to communicate. Uh, with others. And for the 5G, uh, the biggest difference is that 5G will help us, for our industry, for help, for help, to help us to get access and to expand, you know, to the application in the vertical industry. Um, but we will, you know, highly rely on the, you know, features that will be provided by the 5G, faster speed, lower latency, and massive you know, connectivity. So I think any of the vertical industries will have the chance to closely work with our you know, telco industry to figure out you know, how to integrate the you know, capability of 5G network, which is, you know, which is, which is probably become, uh, yeah, to have the chance you know, to to, to become a you know, digital infrastructure of the whole society and then to figure out you know, how we can leverage the capability to you know, uh, trigger some you know, innovation uh, in other vertical industry. Yeah, but to be honest, currently I have no idea you know, how we're gonna leverage the you know, 5G capability on the specific uh, you know, application in the healthcare industry. But that, but that will give us a huge opportunity to work together, yeah, to work together and to figure out you know, what would be the you know, uh, most helpful application in the different vertical industry. And that, that also gives us the uh, you know, implication that the development of the 5G, the model of the development of, uh, of 5G should be different from our existing or past the technology of 3G or 4G. Because for the 3G or 4G, we de develop the technology and you use the technology. But for the 5G, the model should be we work together to, to define what the, te te what the technology is, what the you know, use case is, and then to figure out you know, how to develop the right technology and how to evolve the technology step by step. Thank you. And our other panelists, please. For the two questions, anything you'd like to add? Maybe I could comment on the second one then, on, yes. on the margins. I think my view is that, as I talked about, we have defined uh, the use cases in, in four groups, and especially the, what I call the IoT, the mission critical group, is, is the more uncertain. So it, to me, it depends on very much the, the role that the operators are willing to take on, where in the lower case, based on connectivity, as we do today, mi might be maybe 20% of what mobile broadband is as a business, and in the high case, maybe 50% if they decide to go further in the, in the stack. Then I think in general, for technology going much more into mission critical, where you really depend on the network, the latencies and so on, it's much more difficult to construct everything over the top compared to if it's just best effort. So I, I actually think that many of these cases where the network really plays the crucial role, role in performance, latency, security, and so on, the value will be higher. So to me, that will be a strong factor working against uh, uh, what the question was about. Yeah, I, mean, that's, I was just going to reinforce that point because we, uh, we haven't talked about the, um, 
details of how the, the 5G network will be implemented, what you, you're alluding to, how we can assure certain connectivity levels for mission critical applications. There's something in the standards called network slicing, uh, which we think will be very important for uh, business customers um, and, and will provide a lot of value for them, uh, which hopefully will be shared. The, um, other aspect that we haven't really talked about is how 5G might be critical for domestic small and medium enterprises as well to get to be part. I mean, this is a tool that could be part of their digital transformation. There's a lot of potent value in this uh, for which it's not necessarily something that is easy to um, uh, you know, capture for uh, global players. Ms. Chen, would you like to yeah, add anything? I think pretty much our panelists covered every aspect of it. I think 5G network is not, when we think about it and talk about it, it's no longer the previous generations. The, it's more secure and it's um, with network slicing, you, you can really, um, you, it's really hard for you to do the over the top and provide, just use the connectivity to do over the top. All right, thank you very much. I think that wraps it up for our session. We have run out of time. So, so thank you very much for the audience and for our speakers for a very instructive and uh, inspiring session. Thank you very much. Thank you.